I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversation. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. My guest today is Natalie Elliott Handy. She is an MSW, a seasoned healthcare executive with over 24 years of experience in health and human services. Natalie is currently the Vice President of Government Affairs and Advocacy for Health Connect America. She is a fierce advocate. She collaborates with her sisters on their podcast, Confessions of a Reluctant Caregiver. And along with her sisters, JJ Elliott Hill and Emily Elliott, they founded the Sisterhood of Care, an organization offering caregivers a safe place to relate, learn, be inspired, find hope and obtain the critical resources needed to support their loved ones while also maintaining their sense of self. These women are incredibly dear to me and Natalie is here with me today sharing so honestly and vulnerably and I'm incredibly grateful for their friendship and support. You don't want to miss all of the information that they're sharing so be sure to check out Confessions of a Reluctant Caregiver. Resilience, Hope, and Transformation For almost a year, Natalie Elliott Handy's husband Jason had been experiencing swollen lymph nodes in his neck, and after numerous doctor's visits and biopsies, he was diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma P16 positive. The coming months would be filled with doctor's visits, scans, biopsies, and ultimately they found hope at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Natalie shares all about their experience of what that was like to receive treatment and the journey and the challenge and all that they went through. The cost of the cure was high. Natalie shares with us how the caregiving journey changed her relationship with her husband and how she transitioned from a wife to a caregiver. She learned that being a caregiver is not just about performing tasks but rather comprised of almost 40 different roles. She shares how the journey also pushed her to reprioritize her life. We explore the importance of being present and an advocate during caregiving, the need for continuity of care and providing updates for our loved ones, the overlooked side effect of caregiving, how it changes relationships, leads to complicated emotions and grief. Here is my interview with Natalie Elliott Handy. Hi, Natalie. Hey, we've we've kind of both had a day, huh? Hey, Nicole. How are you doing? Know. I'm good. I'm good. We were just commiserating on life, life. days. <laughs> I was like, life? <laughs> All the real stuff? Oh, well, I'm glad that we have the opportunity to talk and more in a specific way because we've had so many great conversations around caregiving and older adults, but the perspective that touches us in a really real way is when we are caring for a spouse Mm. and you have firsthand experience in that. So what was that like when you got the call or the, were you with your husband? I just want to hear more of the background with your husband, Jason. And okay. So now, okay. Other side note, you're an MSW. You've worked yes. in high level executive mm-hmm. positions in healthcare. So mm-hmm. you have an understanding and you help people navigate the system. And now you're put into this whole experience on the other side in a personal way. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you never experience, you, you don't understand it until you're in the middle of it. And so one, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and to talk to folks because I hope my experience will help be helpful because that's how we learn is through experiences. Absolutely. And, and so I've been in the mental health, mental health field for almost 25 years this year and I've run psychiatric treatment facilities. I've run a company or two or some. And so, and my, I've always said, um, my goal has always been to help others, to serve others. And I think as caregivers, that's the common core of all of us is that we serve, you yourself served others and, and 
and you, and it's in your lean, it's where your passion is. And so no one ever expects to hear either one, you have cancer or two, your husband has cancer. Yeah. And I've always thought of myself as like a mental health concierge. And so if, if the company I had worked for couldn't figure out, like if we couldn't provide the service, I can help you get there. And I'm always the person in charge and the calm because I know that families are in crisis when they come to me. And so it is imperative to be the calm one. And so, because honestly, you're not thinking with your brain, the front of your brain where reasoning and logic happens when you're in a crisis. And so I say that because the moment that you get told that, because you always think it's someone else. And it even feels different. Like my aunt has cancer right now. Mm. That feels different. Mm -hmm. When the person that you love the most in the world, because I don't have children, Mm -hmm. but I do have dogs and I love them a lot too. Yeah. But when the person that you love, your lovey gets told that, it it breaks your heart. And you think, I have no control over this. And for somebody who is in charge of hundreds of people and the lives of thousands of people to make sure their services are right, like that is hard to have no control because that's what you have. You have no control. And so I went from, and this is, I don't, I don't think I shared this in the past. Jason, I'm always in meetings. My husband takes care of me. And so because he's not able to work, he takes care of me to make sure that I can work because I work normal 12, 13 hour days. Right. For you to life. sustain the large role that you have, you right. are supported. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love that. Mm-hmm. And it's a non-traditional role, but he does it and he nails it. I yeah. mean, he cooks every meal. He does everything. And so I was in a meeting and said, hey, do I need to go to this doctor's appointment with you? Do I really need to? Because he had had swollen lymph nodes for a year and he kept he was really body aware. We're not really good about being, having awareness of our body. Some people are, some people are like, "Eh, that's whatever. I wish I did not have the awareness because I'll feel one thing and my head goes to the worst. You have cancer. (laughs) Yeah. If you look up on Google, like I have an eyebrow out of place, you have cancer. Yeah. And so it's, it's, I'm not making fun Mm -hmm. of it, but I mean, honestly, search any medical illness and cancer falls into one of it because I think it's so unknown too. So lymph nodes in his uh, neck? An yep. armpit or where we're okay. They were in his neck and his mm-hmm. right neck. There were swollen lymph nodes. And for over almost a year, he had asked and said, you know, he'd gone to his PCP. he had had some dental work. There was always reasons of why these lymph nodes were swollen. And so um, I finally said, go to, I'm pretty direct, go to the doctor or else you're going to have to just stop talking about these lymph nodes. And so go to a specialist. So he said, okay, I'm going to a specialist. And then I had this super, at the moment, Mm. important meeting that was not remotely important when I look back at it. And I said, do I need to go with you? Because I should be in this meeting. I think everybody expects me there. And he was like, no, it's fine because that's what he does. And um, he says, no, it's fine. It's good. Here, I'll go. And he comes back to me and he says, opens the door, which is because I, this is virtual. This was last year. Yeah. It was February 14th of last year. So thank you. Happy Valentine's Mm -hmm. Day. Opens the door and I look at him and give the universal look of yes. And not without saying anything. And he looks at me and he just shakes his head back and forth. Like it's bad. And that's what he mouthed me. And so I looked at my boss and my other colleagues on the executive team. And I said, I'll be right back. Jason just came back from doctor's appointment. They knew and I, I looked at him, he was sitting at the table and his, his head was in his hands. And I said, what's going on? And he goes, they think I have cancer. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And in my mind, my mind went so many different places. And I thought, I do not have time for him to have cancer. Yeah. Now, let me tell you what a selfish, respectfully mm-hmm. terrible person that feels like. But I'm like, mm-hmm. you can't have cancer. And oh my God. And right. I like, what? Right. And I don't have time for that either. I mean, yeah. I don't have time for my own illness. Yeah. And so he said, we've got to go to, I said, what's the next step? So I immediately go into like fixer. operational mode. Yeah. Opera. I'm like, mm-hmm. th- th- it's go time challenge accepted. Mm-hmm. I'm on this for you. You are my number one client at that mm-hmm. moment. Work took the farthest seat that it has ever taken in 25 years. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, what's next? What do we need to do? And he said, we have to go. We have to have a biopsy. And I said, okay, when? He said, tomorrow. And I'm like, that feels bad because that's so soon. Yeah, it's really like, urgent. I'm like, yeah, I know that's bad. 
that is awfully soon. That makes me feel uncomfortable. Right. And he said, I know. And so our personalities are super different. He's very reserved mm. and I'm very type A and mm. outward. <laughs> no, no stranger. Yin and, and yang, you know, yeah, I think pretty we much get paired together. <laughs> yeah. it works. It works. Um, and so I said, uh, okay. And so over the next two weeks, we, he would have multiple appointments. We would, he would have his, a biopsy where they would put him under and they would, uh, cause they thought it was a type of, uh, mouth, throat and neck cancer. Mm. And so on March the 3rd, because you got to love an EHR, a really good, and I say EHR, electronic health record. You got to love a really good electronic health record who notifies you that your test results are in. And so I was, I, at one point, I was vice president of clinical audit for a mental health company. And that's what I do reviewed was charts for medical necessity. And oh so I got to read charts. Yeah, you're like, I know. All and the so I'm like, and he said, and he said, I just got notification. So this was on the third, it was a Thursday. And I said, okay. And he goes, I don't want to look at it. We need to talk to the doctor first. And I'm like, okay, I won't look at it. Let me have the iPad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Total lie. (laughs) And so I'm on, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm not doing anything. I'm just looking at Facebook. Total lie. I was logging in. (laughs) Immediately. Immediately. (laughs) I look at it and I will never forget. It said squamous cell carcinoma P16 positive metastatic. Wow. And I thought, holy shit, this is bad. Yeah. And that's when your world. And so he looked at me and he goes, you read it. And I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I have cancer. And I said, I think you do. Mm -hmm. And then it makes me want to cry now. Oh, yeah. And I, so I immediately called. It's good when you're in the medical field because you can call anybody you want who has bigger degrees than yours. And so I called a friend of mine and I was like, okay, tell me what this means. Tell me how bad this is. And so I started doing research. And then the next morning we got up and we called the doctor's office. And I said, he called because he's always worried that I'm too directive. Mm. He listened to the conversation he with me and JJ. <laughs> yeah, he, he is like my older sister, JJ, like they're uh, conservative. Yes, and I'm all yes. like, great train, here I come, <laughs> pull it a china shop. And so I'm immediately, I just switched my role. I, at that moment, I never realized I stopped being a wife. Mm. I lost my job title at the moment with his diagnosis. Interesting. I didn't realize that I'd lost it. Everything changed in the moment of his diagnosis and I lost it. And the intimacy that comes with being a wife, you lose because your focus is on everything else. Yeah. And it is solely focused on the diagnosis. And that was when cancer opened the door and walked in our home and sat right between us. Mm -hmm. And it would sit there for, for the remainder of 2022. And so she just sat there between us and I didn't know she was there, but she was there. And and then every commercial you see is about cancer. Every story you see on the news is cancer. Everywhere you turn, it's cancer. And you're like, my God, how do I get away from this? It's everywhere. And so we called the doctor the next morning and I said, okay, you can call. And he goes, I'm going to call first. And I'm like, okay, well, you've called and you tell them that we're going to be seen today. And they're going to explain the diagnosis to us and that we'll do that. And I said, and you need to get an appointment for today. And he said, okay. And he goes, I called and left a message. I said, okay, that's sweet. Now I'm going to call. And so then I called and left a message and said, I have looked at my husband's records. It says that he has cancer. And I suggest you give me a call back within the next 10 minutes because I'm about to drive there and we're going to sit in your lobby until we see someone. So it's your choice how you all want to handle this. But he has squamous cell carcinoma, P16 positive, and I'm going to expect a phone call back from any professional who can explain it to me as quickly as possible. Thank you. So glad that you did that. Yeah. Yep. And we had a call back within 10 minutes and we were on the, on the phone with the doctor who is amazing. We love Dr. Patrick oh. Carpenter. He's our ENT. And he called us and said, don't come in. You're just going to end up waiting. Let me call you. Is it okay if I call you? And we were like, yeah, you can call me. I don't care if you send it by, via smoke signal, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. Tell me what it means. Because Jason is outwardly, he is just this flat affect. His whole life changed in an instant. And he's immediately thinking he's going to die. And I can't do one thing to do that. So now I'm just going to, as my mother would say, respectfully raise hell until I get the answer. Right, right. <laughs> so I am a fierce, <laughs> staunch advocate for those I love. And I'm going to say, I always did it in a respectful way, mm-hmm. but I will not back down. You have to be an advocate as a caregiver. And that is one of the, it, it will make your 
Jason was always nervous that I was going to make the doctors mad, but I didn't. And if they get mad, then I need to help understanding why you're getting mad as I advocate for my husband. So help me understand what makes you uncomfortable about me asking you questions. Just help me understand that. Yeah. Those are my favorite words. Yeah. What a good reminder that we have to be bold and speak up and it's okay if they are uncomfortable with our questions of accountability, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's cancer or Parkinson's or, right. or anything you, the person, this is important to remember, um, just because I work in mental health and I understand about brain body connection, when somebody is in a state of crisis, Jason was in fight, flight, or freeze, and he was basically living from the back of his reptilian brain. His body is trying to say, I have this threat, and I am living in this place of fear, and how do I get past that? And so you're not working from your prefrontal cortex where there is logic. And so that's why it is so imperative for caregivers to be with individuals who go to doctor's appointments, because Jason had issues with memory because, and it's not memory like he's lost his memory. It's that he can't access his catalog of memories of what's been happening to him because he's in a survival state. And so I listen for everything, every detail that he would say to me. And then I would, as he is self-reporting in doctor's offices, I would lovingly, kindly gently remind him this also happened too do you think let's do you think we should talk about that as well and sometimes he would minimize his symptoms because I don't think he wanted to hear the answer of what that meant Mm -hmm. and I can't not have a physician have the full information because then they can't give the best treatment recommendation and protocols and so the caregivers play such an important role but I'm going to tell you I was, and at that moment, I was his wife and I was fierce advocate to help get through this process. And so there's like little kernels. It's, it was after we came home months and months back in, in July, and this was all happening in March, mm-hmm. like this whirlwind that I even knew I was a caregiver, that my roles had changed. That you went from, like you said, in that instance, mm-hmm. wife to caregiver. And the grief, were you able to experience the sadness and the grief in it? Or were you on adrenaline fighter mode? Oh, that's a good way to put it. Because I live in a heightened state of crisis, crisis response, Mm. I'm very, it's very hard to shock me, shock my system because I've seen so many bad things. Mm. Um, Working with children in the foster care system who've been severely abused. It is hard for me to be surprised by exceptional levels of trauma, physical abuse, whatever. I can tell you that, and it's just because of 25 years, you start to just become like a little bit of immune, but that's yeah. You part have, of your, you've had to put mechanisms in place well, so you could do that for, yeah. for the- It's the way that firefighters mm-hmm. are able to run into a fire on purpose. It is day after day of being of exposure to that, that it actually builds resilience to be able to then be able to access your reasoning. Right. And so I can tell you that I never really- cried for the first couple of weeks um, because I was in this adrenaline fighter mode. You're exactly Mm -hmm. right. I was running on high as a kite on octane and and making sure that all of his documentation was accurately reflected so that the doctors understood. I built him a medical chart basically because that's my background. And Mm -hmm. so that it would be easy. I wanted, I knew the importance of continuity of care. So as we went from provider to provider that um, they needed to see him as a, and and offer holistic care and even things that they didn't think about. And so it made it easier. It made the process easier Mm -hmm. when you start to, and, and that's hard because if you're not in the field and, or you've not got experience doing things like that and how to deal with crisis response and how to get through that, it's not going to come natural to you to think, to do that. You don't know what you don't know. I can tell you there, it was probably a couple of weeks in and I was in here my office, I say in here, cause I'm in my office with you mm-hmm. and he was in the other room and I shut the door. And at that moment, this overwhelming sense of just, I can't do this. And the weight of his diagnosis and what happens, it all flooded over me. And I just started bawling, crying. It all just came out. Mm-hmm. And, and then you, 
you get that emotion out. And then I came back to myself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and said, pull it together. You're do you are here for your husband. Yeah. Suck it up. Yeah. And so there are times when we we want to run away. We want to hide inside ourselves when it gets really hard. And I never gave myself permission to do that. And so over the months we did scans and tests and appointments and my work was great. And oh, by the way, I got named CEO two months after. No. I got promoted. So why not get promoted? Here is your promotion. Here's your promotion. Guess what? Yeah. And it was on April Fool's Day. So I always think that's oh. so funny. I was told my boss, I'm like, that's not funny. And I was like, are you sure we should do it now? And he was like, you got it. And I was like, I love the vote of confidence. But I look back <laughs> now and think that was stupid. And so, because I love him, but that was stupid. Yeah. And so then we made our way. Of course, I fought for Jason, but we were going to go with a local provider, cancer provider, and something wasn't right. And I'm always going to tell you as a caregiver, trust your gut. 100%. As a professional, trust your gut, personally, professionally, whatever. The response to a different type and alternative type of treatment, because I'd been doing a lot of research, Jason did no research. And so this is very odd. Jason, before he buys anything, he does an excessive amount of research. And so I know that we're going to purchase it if he does an excessive amount of research on something. He could not handle looking up what his diagnosis was. And he did not look it up until we went to New York two years, two months later. Mm. He refused to, he could not emotionally absorb what it actually Process, meant. Yeah. And so through lots of blessings, I'm going to tell you, Nicole, the cancer journey, uh, and I tell this, and I will say this over and over again, Jason's cancer cured me and it healed me. It killed my relationship with God. It reestablished my relationship with mm. God. It brought us closer because we relied on our faith, which it's in good times. It's easy to, for God to get distancy because as right. humans, we're imperfect. We're and like, I got it. I'm good. Yeah. We're, hey, you know what, God, you know what? Thanks for that. Mm-hmm. I got it. Mm-hmm. You know what? I'm in control. Don't worry about it. You can go work on somebody else who's a hot mess. Mm-hmm. And so, but my friend in trying to understand this said, you know, God gets our attention when he misses us. And I said, well, he didn't have to give Jason cancer. Right. Could <laughs> really? have been another he could just like been like sent a message, like a, <laughs> maybe in like a fortune cookie, like uh, God misses you. You should talk to him before something bad happens. Yeah. But we ended up in New York city and we decided to take the leap. I mean, there were blessings over blessings. Mm. We didn't have the right insurance. We didn't like where we were at. And then we found out that his insurance open enrollment period was open. And then there was one insurance company that covered Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Wow. We live in Virginia. Wow. And so we signed up and within one week we had an appointment and Memorial Sloan is like, if you want, if you have cancer, go there. Yeah. Like I cannot say enough wonderful things about them. They, Jesus handpicked them. <laughs> like I'm, when I say I'm, I'm very religious right, about certain right. things and I'm like every single 11,000 employees. And I did not have one bad experience with all 11,000 of them. I know they're they're They have different offices. It's fine. Right. Yeah. But we went there. And so the insurance, we prayed for the insurance because we were, we were going to sell our home to pay cash for him to go there. And I was like, it's not an option. I will get you the best medical care. And he was like, we can't afford to go there. And then we, the next morning, he got an email in in an email box. He never opened saying that he had an extension and open enrollment. My goodness. I just got goosebumps. Wow. It will. It It was, it was divine intervention. It was not luck. There's not luck in any of this. Mm -hmm. And so then we went there and they said, oh, are you all here for the clinical trial? What clinical trial? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's a clinical trial that if you have a, this type of head and neck cancer, which you qualify for, by the way, you have half the treatment. So instead of seven weeks of radiation to your head and six rounds of chemotherapy, you get 15 days mm. of radiation and three rounds of chemotherapy. Incredible. And, and then he met criteria. Oh, and you get the best radiation therapy. It's new. It's been around for 30 years, but it's still considered new. Mm. So instead of the current radiation type protocols, it destroys the good and the bad cells. This only focuses on the bad cells and it doesn't destroy your good cells in your head. And so 
and oh, and it's paid by a grant in case your insurance doesn't cover it. So Blown we said, wow. So wow. we, we moved to New York city. How is that? Were you like in Manhattan? I was Carrie <laughs> from Sex in the City. Like in my mind, yeah. when I needed to like, we're, we're it in got the so hard. I was Carrie. Seen. I was Carrie from Sex in the City. I was probably Samantha, but I wasn't kind of. You know what? Maybe this in a small way ties in your confessions of a reluctant caregiver cover art idea. Right. Oh, it, it, so you do realize that we, when my sisters and I said we were going to do confessions of a reluctant <laughs> yeah. caregiver and we wanted to do a podcast and we were like, what's it got to be? And I said, mm-hmm. it needs to be sex in the city meets caregiving. Yeah. Let's that's, do it. That's why it looks like that. And it does. It's got <laughs> such a great energy. I love it. It's so good. It is. It's like, cause how do you make caregiving sexy? Right. It's, not. it's not. But it's you not. did. <laughs> It's terrible. Oh, yes. It's like that, you know, that saying where it's like, look for the helpers. I think when I hear you share, it's like you also look for the the hope and the blessing is that you were just able to in the hard hardness in the midst of it, you were pulling out. Okay. We reconnected to God. We found this insurance covered, we were able to get the best care possible and to be open to that. Cause when we close ourselves off and we're, and I know it's so hard when we're in situations like that, but then we're going to miss the magic that can, that can happen, you know? Yeah, totally. yeah. Yeah. So it was funny because my sister chose to move down here. My younger sister moved from Indiana to stay with my dogs. Because my dogs were not city dogs. They they did. And the dogs in New York City are the bougiest dogs. None of them wanted me to let me pet them. <laughs> and all I wanted to do was pet them. And they were like all walking around the city like we're city dogs. Mm-hmm. And so they were also sex in the city dogs. Mm-hmm. And so they were all like, dee, dee, dee. and I'm like, why can I not pet the dogs? And And so we, everything just lined up and it was his plan and it was exactly the way it was meant to be and so you hear about the hands and feet and I grew up in church I'm a I'm a good Baptist and so um and so there's the hands and feet of God and so and if you pray for it he will hear you and he will answer you and sometimes God doesn't answer the way that you expect him to which is inconvenient because we're humans yeah but we had so many people like we, you know, people always talk about like, oh, New York people are really kind of snobby, whatever. Everyone was nice to us. Not one single bad person. And I think it was also that I didn't give them a choice not to be my friend. Right. I talked to everybody right. on the street at MSK, like, because I can tell you we would go for his, when we went, before we moved up there, we had to do a biopsy because we were trying to find the primary location of his cancer. Cause basically Squamous cell carcinoma is a type of head and neck cancer. In men, it is absolutely common. So everybody listen up here. Here's your PSA. It is common in men, Caucasian, 45 to 55. My husband never smoked in his entire life. Mm. And he rarely drank, maybe one drink a week because he likes bourbon and I'm not going to be judgy. Mm-hmm. He, uh, it was either in his tonsil or in the back of his tongue. It had fought, it's a type of HPV. His body had fought it, but it had gotten away. And that's why his lymph nodes were swollen because it had metastasized into his lymph nodes. Mm. And that's how they typically find it because you won't find it in the originating location. And so his body had actually beat, is what they think, the originating location in his tongue or his tonsil. But FYI, in order for them to know that, they had to cut that whole back of his tongue out via laser and they took his tonsils out because he still had his tonsils. And so they lasered his entire mouth. And so if you want to know what strong looks like, Mm. I have never experienced an individual who is so courageous and so strong Mm -hmm. and like, I couldn't have done it. And God knew I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And so I had to be there. I had to be his person because where I'm strong, he's not as strong. And where he's so strong, I'm not. And so I watched him experience this. I remember the first day 
we went for his radiation and they make this mask and it's so scary and they bolt your head down to a table mm. and he literally it never hit me until I got there that I'm like holy crap they're radiating his whole head oh my gosh and I thought holy cow and so I remember sitting in the lobby another time I cried sitting in the lobby he goes back just like where he got called back to a normal appointment mm -hmm. And he comes back out and I have been crying. I've been listening to Christian music because the Lord blesses us with Christian it music. Does. And I was listening to Christian music mm -hmm. and he comes out and he's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, what's wrong? Like, I'm like, you just had your head fried. And, and you, I had to. And, and yeah. so I'm sitting here crying, feeling sorry for myself because I'm like, I can't believe Jason's having this done. But he comes out and he says, look, the mask, because it, it's mesh, mm. because they, it's mesh, and the mm. eye holes um, are covered. So I'll send you a picture because it's worth actually putting. Like, if you ever see it, it's worth seeing. It's scary. It's, it reminds me of like- Oh, um, like one of those- um... Star Wars. Like, remember when yeah. Han Solo was stuck in the thing? <laughs> and like, yeah, that's what it's like, except mesh. So he comes out. And the reason I described this, because it's funny. Like, you have to find the silver lining and all the awful. He goes, look, it left marks on my face. I look like tuna. And I'm like, he goes, I've been caught in a net. And he goes, this is what Tuna looks like. And I thought, you're so idiot. You just had your head fried. You and you're talking it. about looking like Tuna caught in a net. Oh, my word. That he got through that. I believe because you took that fight for him also and was there with him. He felt empowered to make it through the day. Yeah. And he still took care of me. Yeah. Even... Even when, when I needed it, he knew when. Mm. And so I will tell you this. I mean, he, to put up with me, he also has to have the, the, you know, patience of Job, mm. but he and I caregiving is not easy. And I tell people this and I'm, I have to be, I can't feel guilty. This is where the reluctant caregiver comes. Yeah. The reluctance in care be, in being a caregiver is not about, I don't want to take care of my lovey. Mm -hmm. It's not the, it's not that I want to take care of the person. It's the self doubt. And it's the, I'm not going to do it enough. Right. That's what my reluctant caregiver yeah. story is, is that God gave my husband a head and neck cancer. He couldn't eat and I can't cook. Mm. He is the cook. And why? And I, and, and I kept thinking, I'm like, I'm going to fix food for you and I'm going to learn to cook and this and that. And then no, because he couldn't eat anything. Mm. And so he, every meal that I tried to make for him, and it was really not good. I'm not a good cook. Every time I tried to cook something for him, it was so bad. And I started internalizing that failure because mm. it was another failure. Like I couldn't even get cereal right. And it wasn't had nothing to do with the cereal. It's like it all tasted bad to him because his mouth was on fire because they said one of the most painful types of cancer is because it's like, imagine the worst sunburn you've ever had mm. and it's in your mouth and it, it will feel like you're swallowing glass anytime you swallow. That's how they described it to us. And I'm thinking in that moment, because we always had masks on because again, it was right. so pandemic-y time. And I thought, thank God for this mask, because right now the tears are welling up in my eyes as they described it to me. And I could see his eyes just get bigger. And I'm thinking, I'm going to break down. Mm -hmm. Thank God for this mask, because I kept thinking he has to experience that and there's nothing I can do about it. And so, and I will say this, we argued while we were in New York, like, no, you, you think, oh, oh, it's going to be fine. Nobody's going to argue with the person that they're caring for. No, absolutely not. We absolutely got into some arguments. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because I kept working. Mm -hmm. I was an idiot. I kept working. I took intermittent FMLA. Mm -hmm. And in the time that Jason was diagnosed with cancer to October of 2022, so seven months, I took three and a half weeks off and none of it was consecutive. It was an hour here, an hour there. So I kept working because I was such a people pleaser. I can do it all. I'm a recovering perfectionist. Yeah. That's my diagnosis. Yeah. And I kept working. And so if I was late, if I was late, like anytime that, anytime you went into an appointment, because I'm used to working from my phone, I'd have my laptop. I never used that time for myself. Mm. I used it to give it to other people. Yeah. 
and they let me. That would be, I would say, where your mission is now and speaking to people now is saying, this is what I did and I wish I would have done it differently. Oh, you know? completely. Well, and I, I tell them. And so at, he hit every marker that he was supposed to. Mm-hmm. At day 10, they did this type of PET scan to see if his body had responded so that it would either be three weeks of treatment mm-hmm. or it would be seven weeks. Mm-hmm. And understand it was already going to be bad with three. But if he would went to seven, we knew that he would probably have to have a feeding tube. And when you have the feeding tube, you don't want a feeding tube because if you lose your ability to swallow, which is an autonomic nervous system response, you have to relearn how to swallow. So feeding tubes actually, while feel like a blessing initially, they can absolutely be a curse. And so he would do all the exercises to make sure that his jaw didn't get from the radiation and chemotherapy, that his jaw didn't lock up and stop being able to move and use lose function. He did all kinds. He did everything he was supposed to do. But there were times that we would, I would get, I'd have to get on him. Like, Jason, you have to take your meds. I don't want to. And so most people are like, oh, they've got cancer. I'm going to be soft. Not me. Mm -hmm. I knew that if I was not like on him, Jason's time to take your meds. I don't want to. Don't care what you want right now. Right now you have cancer. When you take these meds, you'll be able to sleep better. And, and some people could say, well, that's one way Mm -hmm. (laughs) with his personality needed that. Not everybody needs that. You don't treat everybody the same way. It's individualized care. But there were times I'd be like, and there were times I went to the grocery store every day. So Morton Williams and Trader Joe's are like my favorite. They're my besties, all the staff that work there. I don't know what I needed from the grocery store considering I was the only one who could eat and I can't cook. So I only need cereal and milk really Mm -hmm. and eggs. But I would, that was my time for myself. And those 30 minutes where I would walk on the street and pretend I was someone else and just be like, this could be, what if this was my life? And then I'd go back up and I would go back into the apartment and, and reality would hit me. And so we lived in a great place. I'm very blessed that I could afford it. And, um, but it, this beautiful place, 14th floor in the upper, the midtown on the East side became my ivory tower. And there would be times I'd want to leave. I would just go walk around the city. And of course, Jason was scared. He didn't have enough energy to walk two blocks. And so he would be so nervous that I would walk by myself. And I'm like, honey, all I do is start talking. They'd give me back. They don't want me. They they're, I promise you I'm annoying to them. And so I'm a good Southerner. They would just hate me. And so I would go and walk around the uh, central park was about seven blocks away. And I would go there and I would watch everybody and I would, pretend so we all you you that have was to your way of almost giving yourself time to re-energize yeah on your own and, yeah, I had to film and my medicate body. and we use that word self-care but if we don't oh, I hate self-care but it I was do, but it was you know it was how I filled my bucket yeah I needed the sun yeah Cause it was summer. Yeah. It was summer and I needed the sun. Yeah. And what another silver lining, right? It was summer. You could, it was summer in New York, York city. And, if you I was, <laughs> and I was pretending, I mean, you know, it's whatever. Yeah. And I met so many great people mm. and, and mm-hmm. like it was, and, and all the people would, and we made, like, we shipped all of our stuff, like mm. all of our photos. And so it felt like a home. Mm-hmm. And so here's the crazy part. Like we had cards and people would just write to us and love on us. And I would use, I, I love my, my friends at the caring bridge because I found the caring bridge, which is an online free place. It's a nonprofit. Tia Newcomb is awesome. She's their CEO. Yes. Um, but the caring bridge is a place where you can provide updates to loved ones. That was the best recommend when the, mm-hmm. another best recommendation. Yeah. And it was because I got so overwhelmed when I would try to update people initially. So I started doing the caring bridge, but we, when I told everybody we were going to New York, we called it handy in the city. <laughs> we were, um, yeah. our, and we also had a hashtag handy adventures. Mm-hmm. And so we kept our friends up to date. And so there were, I didn't post about Jason's cancer on mm. Facebook because it was not meant for public consumption. Yeah, And so caring bridge was my little safe space. And what, what I realized quickly, it was like, 
well, this is super depressing. I don't have an update every day, but people are always asking me. And so I started using it as a personal place to journal. Mm -hmm. And I would spend almost two hours every day just writing how I felt. And I felt it was a safe place, even though I knew people could read it. It was a safe place for me to talk about my fears and my insecurities. And I would post photos and I would do funny stories and I would do, you know, handy insights. And I would talk about like, honestly, it's completely open. If you looked up Jason Handy and I don't care if you look it up or not, you can find our story is 50 yeah. entries. Wow. The 50 days we were in New York City and what happened. And you will laugh about the subway. Yeah. Jason was so mad we took the subway <laughs> through the upper, the, the way upper east side, 125th from where we were. <laughs> and he was like, we are not riding the subway again. I don't care if we yeah. have to pay a thousand dollars for an Uber every time. Oh my goodness. It's so funny. I did, we did, I had put, always put pictures. Yeah. yeah. And so here's the thing. It was funny how you've, I was so used to it. Those kind of 60 days, I got so used to it. Mm. And so when we returned home, Jason wanted to come home and I didn't really want to leave the city. Mm. I had had my routine and I was working and we did it. And all we did was go to appointments. And, it, and that includes the weekends because you had infusions, which is just rehydrating him right. um, even on the weekends. And so it was at that moment towards the end that I realized that I had so many jobs and I'd stopped being a wife. It was that moment when I became insightful about that mm -hmm. and through my caring brain journal entries I was so insightful and in seeing things and and realizing that I had reprior I had to reprioritize my life and get my life right and so right hand God's number one myself you have to choose yourself second yeah. because if you don't heal yourself and feel yourself yeah. you will never be good for number three mm -hmm. my husband and then friends, our family and friends is number five. And yeah. work is over here on this left hand. It's, you know, kind of the left hand is kind of hard to use if you're not lefty. Yep, yep, <laughs> sure. You're like over there and it's just kind of like doing its thing. It sort of works for you, but it doesn't. Got to build and that so skill, yep. I had to put work over there. And so Jason was adamant, like, we've got to go home. When, when I go home, it'll all be better because he was so miserable. He hated the city. He hated everything about the city. But I mean, he associates New York with his cancer. Yeah. Everything is awful. And he couldn't explore it in a way like that you no. could or walk around or he probably didn't even feel good being there. You know, oh, no, it felt awful. Good, yeah. It wasn't our furniture. It yeah. wasn't our dogs. It wasn't our, it was noisy. Yeah. He hated this. Yeah. Like what, where I loved the city and, the, and how it never slept. Yeah. He hated the city yeah. and how noisy and how it was no green. And so. Yeah. It's so um, interesting because I'm energized by New York City and I love it and I will go all the time. And I've had friends that are like, I can't deal with it at all. Mm -hmm. And just the, the, you know, stark difference. Yeah. Isn't it funny? Yeah. And it's, it's our personalities. But so we came home, we drove home and driving out of the city. Like I'm an official New Yorker because I drove in New York City. That is like a badge of honor. I was like <laughs> a badge of honor. And so we drove home over two days on July 5th and July 6th. Mm. Got home and it was so good. And we came in and I was so lost. So for weeks, mm. I felt so lost. I had no routine. I didn't know what to do. And that's when we would realize that the cancer was not left in New York. It was, she came home with us yeah. and he lost more weight. He had an even harder time when he came home because his cancer, the last session was on June 20th. And so the cancer, the radiation treatment and the chemo continues to take effect on your body for at least 30 days. Mm. And so we still had appointments. We did virtual appointments mm -hmm. and, but I was so lost and I couldn't find joy in work anymore. Mm -hmm. It was funny. I, I was fine with work in New York. Mm -hmm. but I came back and I was like, I can't, what's wrong with me? And I had no clue. I had caregiver grief. And who grieve? Like who grieves over stop? You know what I mean? Like, it, right. I, and I'm a mental health worker. Right. Like it made no sense to me. Yeah. There's grief and it's not, and he didn't die. So you don't, most people think of grief and associate it with death. Right. But we have changes in our life where one chapter ends and another begins. But I think maybe it's the grief and it was the loss of what we knew that when we came back, we didn't return to normal. We had a new normal. And it was, and the moment that we accepted the new normal and we embraced her, mm -hmm. which is our third wheel cancer, when we embraced her, that she would always be with us is the moment she disappeared. Interesting. 
Wow. Did you and your husband have a conversation together about that? Or did you process individually and come to that place? I think for me, there were some conversations, but for me, it was kind of coming to the realization. And, and when we started doing the podcast and the more we start to get, get connected with caregiving, mm-hmm. that's where I actually really understood what happened in July. Because yeah. I was sitting at the table and it was the third week of July. So I've been back a couple of weeks and, and Jason says to me, I was just sitting there and I was just kind of looking around. I was dazing off and I felt completely disconnected from the world. And so he says, what are you going to do today? And I said, I have no effing clue. Mm-hmm. And he goes, that seems bad. And I'm like, I don't actually care. And I knew I needed to take a couple of days off because I had lost, I, kn- I couldn't figure out who I was mm-hmm. because I was no longer a caregiver because remember it's treatment's done. But it wasn't. Right. And, and, and so as somebody said to me one time, like, oh, well, your caregiver journey's over. And I'm like, you never stop being a caregiver. And that's when I really thought about, like, I wrote down a list. And that's and when I was in New York was in, I wrote down a list of all the job duties that I had. And so I, I started, because I was thinking about what I was going to write in my post for Caring Bridge. You're going to love that. Mm-hmm. And I wrote down 40 different job titles and wife did not show up once. Isn't that odd? That is and that odd. was when I was like, holy crap, I don't feel like a wife. And that's because you're not. Wow. It's not like we kiss. Mm-hmm. You know, you, it's not like you can kiss and hug and, and love on each other like you would like your spouse. They're your lovey. They're the person that loves you the most, yeah. supposedly. Yeah. <laughs> They're required to by law, apparently. Right. And it never showed up. And I thought, holy crap. I would not feel like a wife. I became very aware of it. Mm. I would not feel like myself. I would not really return to myself until I started getting into the podcast. And I threw myself into that because I started getting good at it. And so what did I do? Look at that work. Yeah. I replaced the podcast with work. And so he always, of course he supported me because he knew that was, it was like, Hey, whatever you want to do. Right. right. You want to do a podcast that he doesn't even know what it is, but okay. And didn't understand it, but he's always supportive. Mm -hmm. and uh but it was the wife part Mm. he was the one seeking that out Mm. I was the one that was not ready and you would have thought it would have been the other way right because you would have wanted to pursue that how did you get back to that or have you gotten back to that you know I sort of have it's been a year since his original diagnosis Mm -hmm. and it's hard because it's the normalcy that we, we lost from before. So when we left to go to New York for the moment, the, all the time before they told us, I think you have cancer to now. And he, it's not that I'm not affectionate. It's just our relationships changed. That's a side effect. No one tells you about is that your relationship changed, especially when you have something like this. And I can only imagine what it's like for chronic and Oh, FYI, his cancer is going to come back in five to 10 years because guess what gives you cancer? Radiation chemotherapy. So you intentionally poison yourself. It's like Robin Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. You know, the sacrifice you're going to make now is his, his likelihood less probably because it wasn't as exposed to the seven week protocol, mm-hmm. but you don't think about that when you make the decision, mm-hmm. but there were moments when I'd sit by myself as he was in treatments and I would think, He's intentionally poisoning himself. And so, and he'll get some cancer and it won't be in the same place. It'll be somewhere else. Mm. And so do you think we'll take we that for today? ourselves as spout, you know, I'm thinking through, we've been married for a lot of years also. And in some ways, you know, life changes so much in various seasons of it. And I haven't experienced what you're going through, but I feel like we put this protection mechanism when we fear the new normal. And I think in maybe for your case, you know that maybe this is coming down the road at some point as part of like protecting your heart and mind a little bit where you keep that, I don't know, like not fully wanting to step back into that like wife space wholeheartedly out of like it hurts too bad so we're gonna just like put a wall up a little bit I don't know oh no I have a big giant wall Mm -hmm. I have a big giant wall because of the trauma that you experience Mm -hmm. from this and then you add all of any past trauma in your past experiences Mm -hmm. that compound on top of it and how you deal and this is so important too as a caregiver you have to be so self-aware of your past experiences and what will trigger you yeah and so if you feel if you don't take criticism well because you feel 
feel like nothing's ever right. But was that because you were criticized as a child? Yeah. If you don't take certain things well, if you don't know your trigger points, Mm -hmm. then you will inadvertently lash out to the person you love, Mm -hmm. the person that you're caring for. So you have to be so aware. And so for me, when I think about my caring for Jason versus caring for my mom with my sisters, Mm -hmm. my sisters and I all know what our capacity is to care and the role that we play. I am my husband's only person. Now, alarmingly, There are people who leave their spouse when they have a chronic illness because they cannot handle it. And there, I can only imagine the number of divorces. We posted an article about falling out of love with your spouse after caregiving. And I see it because I can feel that that could, I can easily feel how that would happen. Right. You lose the intimacy yes. and what pulled you together and you try to get it back mm-hmm. and it feels so foreign. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It feels so foreign. Yeah. And so yeah. it's not about sex. It's about like your connection and there's this thing and yeah. And there's clearly nothing need therapy. from the outside, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I clearly like, need therapy, right? but still. And when we're, when we're working through, I think caring for mom or dad versus spouse, it's like. What's so different? What's so different. And the resources are different. Or we, we can say, okay, I need this tool to help me with this, or I'm going to learn yeah. about this. Spouse dynamic intimacy, no one else. Nobody's talking about that. that like, dynamic hey, and is talking intimacy? about it. Right. No. Right. And so if I'm honest about it, I just now in December is when I started feeling like a wife again. Mm-hmm. And we have to work at it. Mm-hmm. We have to go on dates. Mm-hmm. We have to. And, and there was another person that we interviewed in the podcast. She, she felt the same way because of her caring for her mom, mm-hmm. her husband, she and her husband felt more distance because she had to focus there. Yeah. And so she and her husband have to be super intentional about t- doing dates every week so that they remain connected. Is that odd? You don't think that's going to be your caregiving worry. No, but with the whole conversation you guys are having, even with, you know, confessions of that's what we're really feeling though. Oh, and really? we have to talk about it. Yeah. Well, and I talk about yeah. it with Jason. I told him, and you you walk a fine line with the individual who you're cared for, especially if it's your spouse, because when I told him I felt like I could never do anything right mm-hmm. because it didn't feel like I was doing it right, he took it personally. Mm-hmm. I couldn't even, it's hard to even have that conversation because then they feel guilty themselves. Yeah. He felt so guilty when I'd say, I felt like I couldn't do a damn thing right, Jason. Mm. And he was like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been so difficult. Mm. Did you just hear what you said? Like you had cancer. Yeah. You're not, and then I feel worse. Right. And we don't want to bring it up. I I don't even want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So then I can tell you that I had with my sisters who, you know, are my loveys. Mm -hmm. There were maybe five people, including my sisters, that I could be my most authentic Mm -hmm transparent, Mm -hmm. fearless self in saying, when I would say, I love my husband, but there were some times I really wanted to just leave. Yeah. That is the, that is the reluctant. That is the secret. That is the confession. You just want, there are moments that you want to just Mm -hmm. leave and you say, okay, run away. I want to leave. I want to run away. I want to go hide. Mm -hmm. And when my mom, we moved our mom to um, a nursing home. I had that feeling last weekend, Mm -hmm. last week, Mm -hmm. I told the sisters, I was like, I don't feel okay. I feel really off. Mm -hmm. I have this guilt and I don't feel guilty about anything because they know I'm a hard butt. Mm -hmm. And, but I felt so off and and I was like, I feel like there's so much expected of me and I just want to go hide. And that's when I realized I'm like, there I am. Come back to be, come back to the forefront and think, why do you feel this way? And it's because of this. Okay. Now that I know that I feel this way. What can I do about it to help myself to get out of my funk? Right. How do I get out of the barrel? Because I'm going to tell you, you can do it. Yeah. It can be done. Know what you're, know what fills your bucket. And when you're in a good place, write down the things that help fill your bucket. Because when you're in a bad place, you can't think of anything that you can do to make yourself feel better. So go back to your cheat sheet of these things make me happy. These things bring me joy. Go and so I would that. say- yeah. Write down your cheat sheet when you feel good, mm-hmm. regulated, when you're in a good place where you're, you're working from the prefrontal mm-hmm. cortex. 
I know. I'm sorry to talk about the brain so much. No. I relate to that because I want to know why. And I think sometimes we think we're like, for me, it's like, am I crazy for feeling all these different things? And then I go back to, no, there's legitimate science behind what is happening in my brain. And then I feel a little less like alone and crazy in it. I do. And I appreciate your boldness and I appreciate your honesty because you're giving us words for things that a lot of us feel and we don't know. We don't feel the permission to actually say the hard thing, but you guys give us a space to do that. And where would you, where would you have spouses uh, go for support and where can we learn more about what you are up to. And we're going to direct people to the other podcast with the sisters because that's a whole nother fun dynamic. <laughs> yeah, it's totally uh, different. And so yeah. here's the thing, you're allowed to listen to two. You are. Um, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll tell you this. The one thing that I haven't done that needs to be done is Jason and I have not gone to therapy after to talk about how it's impacted our relationship. Mm-hmm. And it's because he's not ready. Mm-hmm. And as a mental health professional, if you only have one side that's ready, Mm -hmm. so then I know better, (laughs) I should go myself. But even knowing what you know, it's still hard. It's so easy to guide other people to do the services. Mm -hmm. It is hard for you to do them yourself because I'm superwoman. I'm supposed to be able to manage all this. What is the problem? And here's the answer is you don't have to. You don't have to. And so... We celebrated in um, January. Jason is 100% cancer free. And that is such a blessing. It was God's blessing. And we saw the scans in his neck of what the tumors look like. And then we saw the scans in January, went to New York. And the funny thing was, Nicole, we launched the podcast January 24th and we got the all clear on January 23rd. And there was no way, we had no intention of scheduling our New York trip Oh, I didn't even think about it. My word. Launched the podcast on the wow. Tuesday, the 24th. And so wow. it was like, it was unbelievable. And you could mm. see there were very clearly these tumors. And then in the scan, the next, right next to it, Dr. Lee showed us, she's amazing. Mm. They were gone. They were just like gone. Unbelievable. Wow. And it gives me goosebumps because, mm-hmm. and, and you just walk out and you just have this feeling of, I can't even describe to you mm. the elation and the yeah. relief and the, and it doesn't matter about what's going to happen in 10 years or five years ever. You're not thinking about that. You're thinking no, you're in that you moment. have cancer. Mm. Hell yes. And like, you're just going <laughs> to cry and you want to scream and you want to yell and you want right. to tell everybody and right. you're just going to be like preaching, praise God. And yes. like, yes. That's what it felt like when we walked out. There were and you just grin on your face. And I think we grinned mm. while we slept. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you would just wake up and you're like, <laughs> like, I looked at him the next morning. We woke up and I'm like, it's a new day. Yeah. You don't have the answer. Uh, have you heard that song called Gratitude by Brandon <gasps> Lake? Ooh. Oh my gosh. Gratitude. That is one uh, of my favorite songs. Yeah. That is one of my yeah. favorite songs. There's also build too. a boat. I mm. mean, if you could have seen, if there was a camera, the mm. one time we had to go, we had to go to the ER mm. during his stay because he had had a problem mm. and MSK has their own ER for their cancer patients. Mm. They are the second, they are bar none the best. Mm-hmm. And so they had taken Jason out because they had to take him to x-ray and I was waiting and I felt like I was listening to my Christian music. Mm-hmm. And that of course, gratitude is one of the songs mm-hmm. that was on there. And I started listening. And so I got up and I started dancing in his wow. room. And if there had been a camera, mm-hmm. I got 15,000 steps in the hour that as I was dancing and jumping and praising and just, uh. It was so yes. funny. You yes. could have had a video. It's like and, that oh, worship and dance, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Was, and it, the funny part is it was Sunday. Oh. Oh. And so I'm like, the thing is, is you can lift yourself. Mm. You can fill your bucket, mm-hmm. even in an empty hospital room and worrying that the staff are going to come by and think you've lost your mind. And the reality is, as a caregiver, you don't really give a damn what anybody right. thinks at, what, at that point. Don't care. Don't care. You do it. You do it. So here's what I think that you need to do. And you might've already done this. Do you have a Spotify playlist to encourage 
You do. Okay. On, on the, I have it and I'll share it with you. It's on our website. Okay. We have a Spotify list of my favorite Christian songs Amazing. that I listen to, and they are absolutely uplifting. Amazing. And Thank you. He, and gratitude is yep. on there. Build a boat is on there. Oh, and there's so it. many of my I'm favorites. I'm like, I love this one. <laughs> and I love I'm this so one. Good. Everybody should listen to oh, it. Oh, so good. Thank you so much. I'm going to include all that in the show notes and where we can learn more confessions of a reluctant caregiver. I love you and your sisters you and, and just, I thank you for sharing so, so honestly that and the hard stuff and, and finding the joy. And I think we all need to hear that and be encouraged. So I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. <laughs> In all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode.